Well, I'm sure it made a difference in your lives when Jesus came into your heart. It certainly did mine. And I'd, I'd like to read from Ephesians chapter 1, the first 14 verses. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. To the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly, heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished upon us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he has purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfilment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. And the Lord bless his word to our hearts. And the object of this letter of Paul is, is to set forth the foundation and the course and the aim of the end of the church. In other words, the, of the faithful in Christ. It's you and I. And he's setting this out in this epistle and in some of the others, a similar um, uh, format. This letter in Ephesians speaks of the Ephesians as a type of the universal church. Hence the word, the phrase, the church. And throughout the epistle, the Ephesian church is spoken of in the singular, not, not in the plural, i.e. Uh, churches. The church, per se, encompasses all of us worldwide. So the letter is directed at us as well as the church at Ephesus. It speaks of the church as the people of God, our foundation our course and our end. It's a theme, as I say, throughout the whole of this letter. Now, the foundation of the church is the will of the Father. That's the absolute foundation of the church itself. The course of the church is by the empowering of the life of Christ within us. And the end of the church is the life of the Holy Spirit in us to carry out our walk. Paul lays down this uh, as a matter of doctrine in this letter and in the others, and he rounds it off in the third uh, um, chapter of this epistle, uh, where it's a prayer for spiritual strength. And I'll read it to you. It's Ephesians 3.14, if you wish to look it up. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge, and that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. 
if we compare that with uh, uh, some verses in Ephesians uh, 1 and, and 2 and then verse, uh, chapter 3, I'll just read them briefly to you so that we've got a, a grip of that. Ephesians 1.11, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will that we might be to the praise of his glory. That's the reason. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. And all this is to the praise of his glory. Then chapter 2 and verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ because it's by grace that we have been saved. And then chapter 3, 16, it says, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. It's in these verses and also from chapter 4 onward, that is that same threefold divisions, the course, sorry, the foundation, the course, and the end. And I remember reading uh, many years ago in the 70s a book by Watchman Nee called Sit, Walk, and Stand. And that echoes what the Apostle Paul is, is uh, laying down this here, the foundation, the course, and the end of, of the church, per se, you and I. Paul shows us the church is founded on the counsel of God the Father, who is above all and through all and in all. He is the most high God, the most high God. And this, the, uh, this our God the Father achieves this through his Son, the only one, one Lord, Jesus Christ, and through the one Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And the Godhead as the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit give their life and their power and their graces to believers. They give this to us, to those who put their trust in Jesus Christ. In other words, they, they've invested in us, in you and me. Can you imagine the Almighty God has invested in you as he's invested in me? And I find that amazing that the God of creation would invest in me his life and his power and his graces. I find that incredible. And the more I think about that, the more excited I become to know that I'm his and that I'm not just a... Yes, I'm a human being, as we all are, but I'm not just a human being. I'm a vessel for Almighty God. And he flows through me. It's his life in me. It's his graces that, that, that empower me, that, that give me the, the life. And these are some of the spiritual blessings that it talks of in, in Ephesians 1 there, that first, first couple of verses. Therefore, believers are, are to exercise this spirituality. You and I are to exercise this in our, in our relationships of life as husbands and wives, as servants, as children. It's, this is how we outwork these graces that God has invested in us. Paul's conclusion in this epistle is to do this, and he says to enable, to enable us to do this, we must put on the whole armour of God. Because this world is, is full of the effects of sin, it's full of sin, it's... Uh, it, it's it's like gravity. It's um, relentless. You know, if you if you throw a ball in the air, it goes up so far and comes down again. And this world is fallen. And um, we, we we have in uh, I'm not going to read it to you, but in Galatians 5, 19 through to 22, there's a there's a description of this this world, the, the works of the of flesh that sin takes us down into. So we need the armour of God. 
that's really what I'm saying to you. We, we, ne we need that whole armour of God. Ephesians 6 and 13. But this letter is uh, written, as I say, to the saints at Ephesus. It's, and he calls them to the faithful. The saints and the faithful are the same persons. We understand that. It's the church. And there are several references to this. Romans 1 and 7. We are called to be saints. You and I. I don't have to be Catholic to be called a saint. I don't have to die to be called a saint. We are saints in the eyes of the Lord once he calls us. And then the opening greetings there in Ephesians 1. It says, to the saints are in Ephesus. You and I. And are faithful in Christ Jesus. And then 2 Corinthians 1 says, he is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he knows our deepest needs. And this father of Jesus is our father too. And as saints we're blessed. Blessed before the foundation of the world. This is what I find incredible. That God gave the blessings before the creation. In the counsel of God. He is a father of compassion. And he comforts us in all our troubles. He comforts us. He's there to comfort us. Whatever we're going through, he's there to comfort us. Now the unbeliever doesn't know any of this. Doesn't know this. Doesn't understand this. It's a mystery. But our God is there. And I think he's, he's the father of compassion. And Nebuchadnezzar knew him. After he had that time when he, was, he became mad and he came out of that. And he said that uh, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honoured him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. The same God that created Adam and Eve and that was with the children of Israel through the wilderness and was with the Israelites. And even when they went into captivity under Nebuchadnezzar, it's the same God from generation to generation. He is there. And this mighty God gave us new life and a spiritual blessing. In 1 Peter 1 and 3, it says, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. The unbeliever doesn't have a living hope. Doesn't know what that means. Yet you and I have been born into that. We have hope beyond ourselves or beyond this world. And it's a living hope. He says here has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If Jesus hadn't come and resurrect, been resurrected, there would be no hope. But because of that, because of God's grace to us, we have been made alive. We have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and kept in heaven for us. This is what the scriptures say. And who by God's power, that's you and I, who are kept by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the end times, the last times. He set us apart. God has taken you and I in his foreknowledge or in his predestination, that's a whole new, another subject, but it's certainly in his foreknowledge, he's plucked us out. When we placed our trust in Jesus, when we saw for that first time that Jesus died for us and we embraced him into our lives, he set us apart. God sanctified us in his foreknowledge. Our sanctification. Sanctification, rather. Our sanctification was determined even before our faith. Way back in, in pre-creation, if you like, God 
in his counsel, knew the, the, the condition of man. And in that foreknowledge, he, he chose us. He set us aside. We are for his uh, uh, glory. God's grace at first sanctifying us, that's what he did. That's setting us apart in his eternal purposes. Set us apart as holy to himself. Clean. And secondly, our faith. That was God's gift. As, as sanctification, as new life is. It, gift, uh, faith is God's gift. To you, to me. I, I, I didn't know anything about faith before. I could, really, before I came to God, I always believed there was a God. Right from a small kitty, I would think I believed that there was a God. But it wasn't until I was of that age, I was 15, that I placed my trust in Jesus. I exercised faith. And that was a gift of God. And I accepted that. And that enabled me to grasp hold of salvation. And that, that was a beginning of a new life. And the praise to God in almost all the epistles implies the real sense of grace uh, that was experienced by the writers, uh, particularly Paul, but and their readers. A real sense of grace in the new birth and the living hope. It's proclaimed in, in that letter in Peter and in, uh, echoed in 2 Thessalonians. I'll just read that again to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has called us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through the faith for, of, uh, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's Peter. And then echoed in Thessalonians, because God chose you as firstfruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. It's the truth of God's word that stimulates faith in us and creates new life in us. So we were given, we were sanctified, given a new life. But what other spiritual blessings are there that Paul in the Ephesians talks about and set forth uh, the gospel of the grace of God? That's the Father's heart that he's setting forth here. The Father's heart, that's the work of love. It's the work of love, the work of Almighty God. And it tells us that we've been blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. I wonder if you've sort of ever considered what the spiritual blessings are. Because sometimes we, and I have to confess, I do it as well, that we've read the scripture so many times and we just accept it. But spiritual blessings, this is what caught my attention or caught my spirit some three or four weeks ago. Again, spiritual blessings are unknown by the unbeliever. They're incomprehensible to them. They don't understand. Spiritual blessings, what, what does that mean? Well, if this, if this first chapter of Ephesians enumerates some of them, uh, we'll just quickly go through some of them. Uh, verse 4, we had chosen before the creation of the world. How amazing is that? <clears throat> chosen before the creation of the world. To be his sons. Not just chosen, but chosen to be his sons. What does that mean? It means to be part of the family, part of his family. If you're a son, you're, you have relationship. And the scriptures told me that he knew me when I was in my mother's womb. He chose me 
before the foundation of the world. That's what I find incredible. I confess I don't fully understand these things, but the word of God is truth, and I found it to be real. That was the first thing I, I found there, and you can see that echoed in, way back in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 7 and verse 6, and the New Testament, Matthew 11 and 28. And then it goes on, he says that we were chosen to be holy, not only to be sons, but to be holy and blameless. That means my sins are forgiven. None of my sins, my wrongs are going to be held against me. I've been cleansed. You have been cleansed. The church per se, the saints of God, those who are faithful, have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We've been set apart, sanctified, made whole. And then, then in verse 5 it says that we're chosen to be adopted. Can you imagine that? If you were... Just think of the royal family. If you were adopted into the royal family, what would that mean? You would become a son of the king or queen. But we are sons of the Almighty. But if you were adopted into the royal family, you'd have royal privileges. You'd have a, a, a life above the norm. Yes, you'd live in this world. But you would have a, a very special kind of life. The privileges that go with royalty. And you and I have been born into a royal kingdom. Into a royal family. The family of God. And we share the blessings of God. The blessings that God poured out on the saints. We share that life that Jesus portrayed to us that he showed to us when he walked the earth we have a share in that he's a part of the the spiritual blessings and all this was determined in heaven before the the, the council or being in God's council before the creation God determined these things I find that absolutely amazing and if we, if we think on these things, it, it, it stirs our hearts. I hope it stirs yours. It, it does mine. We've been chosen for a purpose. So we weren't just chosen and plucked up and put somewhere. We're chosen for a purpose. We were chosen to be the, for the glory of God, for the praise of his grace. That was verse 6. Verse 7 says that we have redemption through his blood. Forgiveness. Cleansing from sin. It's sin that's brought this world down. It's sin that was the uh, movement behind the works of the flesh. All that that we, ha we have to combat day by day. And we see it on every hand. You can't turn on the television without somebody talking about abuse. There's Diane's brother on um, Laura Kunzberg program this morning, giving his testimony about how he was abused as a boy. And we see it on every hand, don't we? All what's happening around our nation, let alone the other nations, where things are even worse in many of them. But we have been cleansed and we have been given the, the, the whole armour of God to, to, uh, to, to battle, to, to uh, stand against that. But it also says that in verse 8 and 9, it says that he lavished us, lavished us, poured out upon us his wisdom and understanding and made known to us, to the church, the mystery of his will. And it is a mystery to those that don't know Jesus. They can't understand it. They don't know what God has in store for them. So it is a mystery. But God has lavished upon you and I his wisdom and understanding. It's written there in the word of God. Don't take my word for it. And then in verse 10 it says, One day this mystery 
will be fulfilled. God will bring everything in heaven and earth together. And when God does that, we have a place in it. Whether we are still here and are caught up in the, uh, in the rapture or whether we have passed away and we'll, he'll bring us together with him. We have a place in that. And we have a guarantee. We have a guaranteed inheritance. So we've been predestined, chosen to be heirs because we have uh, a legacy that's coming to us. Chosen to be heirs so that we, we enjoy uh, all the graces of God that he has poured out upon us. And we've been marked with a seal. We've been marked with a seal. That's the deposit of the, of the promise. It's a guarantee. It's like, the, like a certificate of marriage. It happened. And we've been sealed. That is a, it's the deposit within us that, that we have that guarantee. And it's a guarantee of our inheritance of eternal life. And this is only just the beginning. This is only the beginning. All this, it's a mystery that the unbeliever, as I keep saying, has no understanding of doesn't know what's happening, doesn't know what's available, doesn't know what the the blessings of a new life in Christ are. They think that partying is the the best thing that can happen, but doesn't even come close to the blessings that God has for us. Doesn't come close. When Mary went to the garden, and she recognised Jesus. He, Jesus said to her, Don't cling, cling to me, for I have not yet ascend, ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to, the, to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. God, the Most High One that Nebuchadnezzar gave, praise to this God is the God and Father of Jesus this is the God that sent him here but this God the most high one is also the promise maker he's the promise maker of the divine word this word that we have he placed this world In a, in a place where he, he determined that certain things would happen through its lifetime. And he made promises in this Bible as we know it. I'm, I'm told that there's over 3,000 promises here. And it says that they're all yes and amen. They're God's promises. Now, I'm, I'm sure we've all got friends who've made promises and they're not been able to keep them. But God keeps his word. When he spoke to the prophets of uh, Isaiah and, and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and he spoke to them about what would happen, and we see it happening today, that's a fulfilment of his prophecies. And I'm sure that you've had things, you, you've stood on the, the promises of God and you've prayed and you've seen the answers to prayer. I'm sure if we had time, we could all tell about those occasions. I've found God to be true in my own life and in my family's life. I can only speak for them. But I'm sure you know the, the same fulfilment of promises in your own, land, own, uh, own families and own uh, lives. But it says in, in Ephesians 1 and 3, it says that God has, has blessed us. He's already done it. That's referring to the past original counsel of God. It wasn't, it didn't wait until Jesus came and died and decided to raise him from the dead. God determined this way back in his counsel before the beginning of things. This most high God. 
is the promise maker of the divine word. The Bible as we know it. And this promise maker is also the bestower. The one who bestows these spiritual blessings from the heavenly realms. These are not things that are bestowed upon us by our government or the, even the king and queen if we were adopted into their family. This has been bestowed upon, these spiritual blessings have been bestowed upon us by, by Almighty God, the Most High One. And he did that before the creation of the world. All of the blessings that God has now poured out he determined before the creation of the world. He pre prepared them even before the coming of Jesus and the cross and resurrection. That's the point that we could enter into these things, but they were determined way back. It was determined in God's foreknowledge. Our spiritual blessings come from him, come from God from the throne of God. How amazing is that? These spiritual blessings have been ordained for us who believe since before time began. They've been ordained for us. And it's up to us to enter into these things, not just to sit in a church and attend a Sunday service. It's through relationship. We grow into these things. They've been ordained. God blesses his children. And not just in mere words. Before we were born. But in acts. God blesses us. Just the beginning. How exciting is it? Do you, can you, do you get excited about these things? About all that God has for us. For you personally. Not just for me, or just for Gloria, but for all of us. God has these things for all of us. If we can grasp it, God didn't just stop there. But he promised us even more. He promised us his presence, his power, and his authority. And if that wasn't enough, he, 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 there was even more. He promised us access to his counsel through prayer. He promised us the fullness of the Holy Spirit. That's empowerment. He promised us the fruits of the Spirit. He promised us the armour of God for protection and battle in this world to fight sin which is relentless. He promised us his authority to act in his name, to act as his ambassadors in this world that we could re represent him, that we could cast out demons and heal the sick. We can expect these things to happen. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead. Because he was victorious and he gave us the victory. We now live in him. What an amazing God. In addition to that, he says, I will never leave you. His presence is with us day by day, every day, every moment, when we're awake and when we're asleep. God is with us. His presence is with us. Not just with us, but he lives within us. That makes us a little different to the unbeliever. We are heirs, joint heirs with Christ. In eternity. Scripture tells me that God didn't do this sparingly. It says that he lavished these gifts upon us. Lavished them on us. Who are we? We are his adopted sons and daughters. Adopted into his family. That means relationship. It doesn't mean attendance. It means relationship. As we come into relationship with Almighty God, he lavishes us with wisdom and grace.
God prepared us for a new life. And he prepared a new life for us. A different life. He prepared a life in the spirit. Not a human life. Not just a human life. Yes, we enjoy a human life. We're alive in this world. But he prepared something better. A life in the spirit. That's what he's given us. And it says that we are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. I find that amazing. I don't know what good works that you're involved in or we don't know our own sometimes. I don't know. But this I know, that the closer we walk with the Lord, the greater his presence in us and he leads us into the things that he would wish us to accomplish. If we'll submit to him, there's a life of adventure waiting for us. But we have choices. And sin is relentless. But we have a choice. We can turn to Jesus. We can overcome sin in our lives. Through the life of Christ. So then... When you get a glimpse of, glimpse of the promised land, as Israel did when they went into Canaan, they had a glimpse of the promised land. They saw all the promises of God, or they, they saw the fruit, they saw all the, the splendour of this land. And when you get a glimpse of that, all these promises of God, the blessings of God, the spiritual blessings of God, when you get a glimpse of them, don't hold back. Embrace all that God has for you embrace it all that's what Jesus died for that's why Christ came that's why he went to the cross that we could enter into this new life into this adventure that's waiting and we'll become the praise to the glory of God so when you grasp the reality of the promises of God that he has set before us you'll see the fruit of Canaan. When we enter into this new life, you'll see all that God has prepared for us, all the, ble all the blessings, the spiritual blessings and the gifts that he's given. And I've only really touched the surface of them. God has so much for us that we can enjoy and it's for the praise of his glory. Fruit you'll see if you look into Canaan's land. That's God's blessings. It's a promise of the future. When we see and read about these blessings of God and the fruit of the Spirit and the anointing of the fullness of God, these are the, these are the fruits of, our, of this new life. And we will see them as the promise of the future. But the Israelites, they were put off by the giants. And I'm saying to you, don't be put off. Don't be put off by the giants, the people that will talk you out of it. The theology of the some of the churches. If we stay true to the word of God, God will stay true to us. So I just encourage you. See what God has. Dwell in the scriptures. Look at the blessings that he has for us. For this reason, this is Paul uh, speaking, for this reason I kneel before the Father from whom the whole, his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled 
to the measure of all the fullness of God. I encourage you to reach out to be, to embrace these scriptures to be, so that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God in your lives. Praise the Lord.